tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Everett House Hotel, St. Louis, Missouri, 17 October 1865. Part 1. The Reporter. Any interesting characters come in lately, Scott? Matthew Bartle, reporter for the Missouri Democrat, asked the hotel's barkeep as he took a sip of the whiskey he just ordered from an old friend. Well, there's this trapper that just got in. Took a Missouri River steamer all the way from Montana. He tells a truly strange tale, Scott said as he finished polishing one glass and picked up another. He's upstairs with a... The sound of footfalls on a staircase drew the barkeep's attention away from the glass in hand. You're in luck. Here he comes now. A man with an unruly beard and shoulder-length dark hair descended the stairs. He was dressed well in new clothes. A white vest, three-button shirt, checkered trousers, and around his shirt collar he wore a stock permanently tied into a bow. Whiskey, Scott, he said as he took a seat his attention on the mirror behind the bar rather than the reporter sitting next to him. Pardon me, Matt began. I hear you've got a strange story. The trapper took an appraising look at the young reporter. Who the hell's asking? Matthew Bartle, the Missouri Democrat. He extended a hand the trapper left unshook. Why would a fancy city reporter be interested in what a trapper has to say? The old trapper asked looking at Matthew over the rim of his whiskey glass as he waited for an answer. Well, I've known Scott here a long time, and when he tells me someone has a story, it makes for titillating reading for our readers. The man stared into the mirror with a faraway look, his eyes darting as he lost himself in thought. You'd never believe me. Come on, trappers are legendary for their tall tales, Matthew pressed. Exactly. This is the tallest of them all, all true, which is why you won't believe a word of it, he said, throwing back his whiskey. I'd better be going, he stood to leave. Dreams, Scott said, causing the trapper to stop in his tracks. I've known both of you for a long time. I can vouch for Matthew, turned his attention to the reporter. James stays at the Everett every time he passes through St. Louis. Now, he's normally the loudest trapper with the most fantastic stories that stretch credulity. But, the word hung in the silence of his pause, whatever the truth to his story, it's changed him. He's humbler. You can't keep bar and not learn to spot when a man is telling the truth, pulling your leg, or outright lying. And in this, I believe him. James shook his head as he settled back onto his bar stool. Will you swear to not write it if you don't believe me? I swear it, James, Matthew replied, pulling out his pocket diary to take notes. First things first, what is your full name? James Lumley. Well, Mr. Lumley, it's a pleasure meeting you. He once more extended his hand. This time, after a brief hesitation, did James shake it. What is this extraordinary story that could so change a man? Matthew prepared to hear a fiction that aggrandized Mr. Lumley as much as it stretched credulity, adopted a passive expression. Well, last September I was trapping about 75 or 100 miles above the Great Falls of the Upper Missouri. I'd set up my camp around the area known as Kadat's Pass, and just after sunset, a shooting star blazed through the sky. Now when I say shooting star, I don't know what in the hell it was. I couldn't look directly at it because it was like staring into the sun. After about five seconds, it burst, reminding me of a skyrocket. Wait, this was last September? Matthew interrupted, his voice excited and his expression no longer passive but fully engaged. Yes, James said nervously. So what? Does the name Colonel Benjamin Bonneville mean anything to you? Matthew asked as he jotted a note. Not at all, James replied. Well, he's the commanding officer of Benton Barracks here in St. Louis. 
Last September, he witnessed a meteor here that was also reported in Leavenworth and Galena. Leavenworth reported they saw it explode. Could it be the same luminous body? Matthew made a note of his thoughts. James shrugged. Well, I don't know about such things. I just know that after a few minutes, there was an explosion that shook the earth. Then the rush of a tornado swept through the forest, a strong wind that was there one moment and then suddenly gone the next. The trapper shuddered. The stink of sulfur filled the air. That the object came from the west left me unsettled. Why? The westerly entrance to Kadat's Pass is known as Hellgate. A man in that predicament can't help but wonder if a demon had escaped hell. Eventually, I did get some sleep. In the morning, I went to check my traps I'd set about three miles east of camp. I'd gone about two miles when I came upon a new path. Several rods wide had been cut through the forest. Trees, not saplings, mind you, but massive kings of the forest were everywhere in this path uprooted. Those trees whose roots were too strong were broke off at the ground. It looked as if God himself had plowed the earth here and the trees were but grass to him. Matthew was transfixed now. Please tell me you investigated. James nodded. Against my better judgment, and I wish I hadn't given in to curiosity. What did you find? I followed the desolation, and at its end was a massive stone driven into the side of a mountain. I made my way to it, and as I neared it, I found bits and pieces of what I assume was glass. The ground was dark in spots as if water or even blood had been spilled on it. You discovered Bonneville's meteor. Matthew was scribbling furiously in his pocket diary. Did you get near it? I did. As I got close, I saw where it had cracked open and I could peer inside. It had rooms. There were pictures on the walls, but not like what fancy city folk decorate their walls with, but more like writing. What do they call it? Like they found in Egypt? Hieroglyphics? Matthew offered. Yes, James exclaimed. While it looked like a nugget of some sort of mineral, it had to be made by man. Nothing like that exists in nature. Did you go inside? Matthew asked. James once more stared into nothingness. The silence dragged and Matthew was about to speak when James finally answered, that's my story. Matthew studied the trapper for a few moments before deciding he had enough to write a story. Thank you, Mr. Lumley. For the record, I believe you, and if you wish to read it, my article will probably run the day after tomorrow. James nodded and offered no other response as Matthew gathered his thoughts and his things and left the hotel bar. Part 2. The Gambler James was about to stand and take a walk to clear his head when a man stepped next to him at the bar. Barkeep, the stranger said. Two whiskeys. The good stuff. Scott placed two glasses in front of the man who slid one in front of James. It's common courtesy to order the man next to you a whiskey too. Scott began pouring. Thank you, James said, raising his glass. The name's Walter Dim. You can call me Walt. Hell of a story you've got. James lowered his glass and grunted. You know what I think? Walt continued. I think you fibbed to that reporter fella, saying you didn't go inside. James fixed the stranger with an icy stare. I'm no liar. I didn't say anything. Walt laughed. Well... What we don't say as often reveals more than what we do say. Is that so? James asked half-heartedly. It is. I'm something of a gambler. It's important to learn to read people so you know the cards they're holding. Walt sipped his whiskey. That's some good fire water, Scott. And what cards am I holding? I think you're out of aces and looking to cash out. Your clothes are new, so whatever you saw on that stone has made you reconsider your trade. Walt took the last swallow of whiskey, motioned to Scott to pour another. I don't want to talk about it, James responded, placing a hand over his glass. 
I'm not going to let drink loosen my tongue. What about a friendly game of cards? Walt said, pulling a pack out of his pocket and nodding toward the tables. An hour later and James was looking at the pile of chips that once was his but now belonged to Walt. The other man cleared his throat and began to speak. I can tell by your face that you're all out of jacks. While money is nice, there's something I care about more than money. I love a good story, especially if it's true. Even the fantastical ones? That stretches belief, James said, letting out a sigh of resignation. Especially those, Walt said as a grin spread across his face. Well, there I was in Kadat's Pass, James began. The sun was low in the sky, which told me it was about eight o'clock that time of the year. Kadat's Pass, Montana, last September. James stood in awe at the stone he witnessed break apart last night. It reminded him of a silver nugget he had seen smelted once. Right before turning to liquid, the nugget stubbornly held on to its shape, although its surface had already begun to melt. Had the smith cooled the nugget at that exact moment was the best way James would ever be able to describe the object before him. Heat, like a hot August day, wafted off the thing and he heard strange popping and pinging noises as it cooled. Had it been any hotter, he would not have been able to get any closer to a large gash in the object. A trail of the strange glass he had followed along the gash left by its crash led inside. He was thankful he still wore his summer buckskins and soft moccasins. The hairs on the back of his neck prickled as he neared it. After spending his adult life in the wilderness, he had learned to sense when he was being watched. Moreover, he knew the difference between being watched by man and animal. The sensation he felt was neither. When he was near enough, he could stick his head through the jagged gash he called out to anyone or anything inside. Hello? Only his echo answered. He stepped inside. His feet barely made a sound as he stepped onto a metal floor as cool as the air inside. He was amazed at the temperature drop. Bright, unnatural light blinded him as he stepped into a dark passage. When his eyes adjusted, he could see alien hieroglyphics on the walls. James explored the object going through random compartments. Some contained what looked like bunk rooms, others some sort of sanitation. The room that left him most unsettled had a large slab enough for a man to lay on. The slab did not bother him, but a group of hoses ending in various instruments reminded him of a short story he read in a hand-me-down copy of The Gift, a Christmas and New Year's present for 1843. In that story by a chap named Poe, a prisoner recalled a cruel death sentence he narrowly avoided when the French army saved him from the Spanish Inquisition. As his explorations drew him closer to the center of the object, which he had begun to think of as a grand river boat, but one that came from the heavens, he heard and felt a steady thrumming. The glass shards that had been strewn about the main passageways were thinning out as the thrumming became more intense. The temperature also began to rise. The lights flickered and he became aware of a faint green glow. Finally, he turned a corner and beheld a perfect green sphere of lightning floating in the middle of an all-white room. Along the top and bottom of the walls were the jagged remains of glass that suggested it contained the energy source. James lacked the knowledge and education to comprehend what he saw, but the suggestion that this was the craft's engine entered his mind. He began to feel nauseous and ran from the room, stopping to vomit a few times until the gash he came through came into sight. He stopped in his tracks as he saw the night sky. Best he could tell, he had only been inside the thing for an hour but as he exited the moon's position told him it was well past midnight. James collapsed and closed his eyes tightly. Images of where he was came into his mind. He saw the craft crashing into the mountain. A small gray creature, almost human, appearing from the gash he had entered the ship and on shaky legs stumbling into the woods lining the path of the crash. James saw himself entering. The images invading his mind sped up. Most were banal, woodland creatures living their lives in the craft's shadow as nature healed. The area left largely untouched by humans until strange men dressed in green appeared. They were in horseless vehicles, every bit as peculiar as the object he had just been in. Then the object was gone and nature returned. 
as did people in ever more outrageous and impractical clothes lazily exploring the area. More horseless vehicles crunching through the path the ship made as it crashed. He fell to the ground and his mind struggled to make sense of everything he saw, including magnificent machines cruising through the blue heavens. The final thing he saw was the land completely devoid of life, a burning hot hellscape. James began to cry at the loss of the nature he loved so deeply. A soft hand on his shoulder made him look up. He screamed as he stared into the abyss of two black almond-shaped eyes. The face those eyes were set in terrified him, a dirty gray color half of which appeared to have been burned. He screamed as the creature tugged at his clothes, pulling him to his feet. He felt another set of hands on him, pulling him back towards the ship. This one had dirt smudged on its face. One of its arms hung limply at the side opposite James. No! He screamed. Let go of me! Please! His captors did not speak and ignored him as they just drug him towards the vessel and down the hallway to the room with the slab and strange instruments dangling from the ceiling. No! For the love of God, please! His voice grew in pitch as they laid him on the slab. He tried to move only to find he could not lift a finger. He watched as the creatures grabbed the devices and pulled them down from the ceiling towards him. Everett House Hotel, St. Louis, Missouri, 17 October, 1865. I woke up back in my camp, James said, his hand trembling as he took a sip of whiskey. It was early morning, and yet it only seemed a few hours had passed. Walt leaned back in his chair. That is an incredible tale. He took a sip of his own drink, and one that is truly hard to swallow. But you tell it with so much sincerity. I've read that those who study the stars believe it's probable that other planets and even meteors may be inhabited. And you, my friend, may have been the first person in history to meet one. James looked away. God save us all. I don't know about such things. I think they are demons myself. He slammed his whiskey. However, I know in my bones that I saw the future, and it terrified me more than the demon's hellish instruments. He stood. Thank you for the drink, friend, but now I'm going to take my leave. He put on his hat and tipped it before turning to leave the hotel and disappeared to history. Leaving behind a newspaper article, and a mystery. Dear Sir, I won't pretend to feel anything other than a deep dread at the receipt of your letter. How you came by my name and of my involvement in the mentioned incident causes me a great deal of consternation. Considering the effort I've made over the years to hide my presence at the event. As you correctly stated, I was indeed in Visay when the hikers passed through. After some little trouble with local government in my hometown, I was spending time there on the down low, as I understand the expression is. I had not met the group before, but we had a chance to meet during the purchasing of food, and I found them friendly and forthcoming. And I'll admit that their little expedition seemed an enjoyable one to me, though I had not their experience in climbing and mountaineering. My hesitation on whether to join them or not originally led me to start out alone on my own journey on a somewhat parallel route, though with a different destination. But I found myself oddly drawn to that intriguingly determined little group, and so eventually changed my mind and my path. They had taken the first part of their journey quite easily, and I was able to catch up with them in the Highland area around, I believe, the 31st, after Uden had already departed the expedition due to injury. The lone female member of the group, Lyudmila, seemed pleased to have more female company and the group as a whole welcomed me as a friend. It warmed my heart. After all, I could have no idea what was to come. The first sign that the journey would not be what we hoped was the worsening weather conditions, sharp snowstorms that destroyed our visibility and as a less experienced hiker, I found this quite disconcerting, but the rest of the group were made of sturdier stuff and were not so phased. 
even when it transpired that we had become a little lost and had deviated from our path, finding ourselves towards the top of the Kolat. They merely decided that we should set up camp, Igor stating that it would be a good practice of slope camping and not wanting to lose the height we had conquered. Oh, that we had been more cautious, been less eager. Despite the presence of women in the group, we shared one tent between the ten of us and practicality being far more important in the circumstances than propriety. It was actually Lyudmila that woke up first that night, her movement waking me. Can, can you hear that, Veta? she asked, and the concern in her voice made me hesitate. In the silence of the night for several moments, all I could hear was the gentle breathing of our companions. And then there was a crunch of snow outside and a sharp noise like the heavy breath of a large animal, a bear perhaps, though we were aware of nothing like it in the area. Lyudmila and myself, we froze, our eyes locked together, and then she reached over and gripped Igor's arm. His eyes opened blearily and focused on us, and I saw his expression grow puzzled as he watched me press a finger to my lips. Huh? What? He sat up carefully and he stared at us, a question on his face. In answer, I just pointed to where the sound seemed to be coming from. It was closer now, and whatever it was seemed to have its face pressed to the side of the tent as I could hear it sniffing along the bottom of the material. I was aware of the other members of the group awakening, slowly sitting up, their bodies still and silent as they heard the thing outside investigating us. I don't know what we all felt at that moment. Some fear, certainly, but perhaps not terror. A large animal does not necessarily mean a predator after all, and our tent was sturdy in any case. I caught Igor's eye, and his calmness soothed me. The thing outside was moving around towards the front of the tent, towards the opening that we believed to be securely tied. And then, the noise. Oh God, the noise. I can't describe it fully. Something like a scream, but furious. Somehow high-pitched and shrieking, and yet with some lower rumble of bass that seemed to make the ground shake beneath us. There were cries of fear within the group, and we grasped each other. At my side and absolutely terrified, Yuri snatched his knife out of his bag and he slashed it through the side of the tent. The slit he made was easily big enough for him to fit through, and he fled out of it, followed quickly by Giorgi. As the thing outside pushed against the front of the tent, the rest of us surged forward towards this escape route, briefly bottlenecking. Whilst behind us, that awful roar grew louder, and then we were free, and fleeing down the slopes towards the nearest shelter we could find. I don't know how long we ran, freezing, terrified and pursued by that creature before we saw the woods ahead of us and we barreled in. We scrambled into bushes and up trees breathless and trying to make each other out in the darkness as well as to see if that thing had followed. There was silence around us and I think we all dared to hope that we had escaped. But whatever elation could have been in store for us was quickly dashed by the realization of our situation. We were outside, in the freezing cold, most of us without shoes even, and with no way to find our way back to the dark, to our belongings. I, I'm not sure how long we cowered there before we realized that we were going to have to at least attempt to return back the way we came. Georgie and Yuri were already beginning to succumb to the first signs of hypothermia. I heard Zeneda shushing Yuri, who was shaking violently and hissing about his bare feet. There were 
hushed discussions of starting a fire, but I think we were scared that it would bring the creature back to us. So cold. Igor made the decision that the rest of us would stay in the woods, while he, Zeneda, and Rustam would attempt to return to the tent to fetch clothing and provisions. They left soon after. We never saw them again. After several hours, Nikolai urged us to start at least a small fire if we didn't want to lose Yuri and Georgie, who were huddled at the bottom of a pine, deathly pale. Yuri had already tried to remove his clothes once. I'm sure that many of your education is aware of paradoxical undressing. Though Lyudmila had managed to stop him. Semyon agreed and we collected firewood and attempted a blaze, though without much luck never really managing more than a sputtering failure. And after Yuri suddenly jerked his leg, knocking the fire out and singeing his trousers in the process, despite the bitter weather, we gave up. But you have to be practical in these circumstances, you see, so when Yuri and Georgie were seen to not need them anymore, we took their clothing. Their troubles were over. It was Alexander who first stated that he did not believe that Igor and the others would be returning and that, if we wanted to survive this, we would need to set out on our own. Those of us that remained, myself, Lyudmila, Nikolai, and Semyon, had to agree. We were on our own. We set out carefully and quietly as we could, thinking to follow in the footsteps of Igor and the others and make our way back to the tent. We stayed close together, eyes wide and staring out into the darkness. That we had already lost our way only became apparent when moonlight burst out from behind a cloud and shone down on a gaping ravine that none of us could remember on our flight down from the tent to relative safety. Should we turn back? whispered Alexander to the rest of us, but before any of us could answer, Nikolai glanced behind us and let out an awful cry. I don't believe the rest of us looked to see what he had seen. We had a good idea after all, but instead just ran as fast as we could away from it. In the panic, Nikolai, terrified by what he'd seen, stumbled the wrong way, and I saw him disappear over the nearby edge. Lyudmila screamed at that and immediately changed her course to a path that led towards the ravine and down, perhaps hoping that we could somehow save him. Semyon, Alexander, and I followed her. There was nowhere to hide up here after all. We ran and slipped our way down to the creek at the bottom, but there was no time to look for Nikolai. The creature had followed us. We could hear its fast footsteps and its grumbling growl. I tried to sneak a look over my shoulder as I ran, but could only make out a shadowy shape in the darkness. Our group found itself splitting up, each trying to make different cover. I saw Lyudmila make for a group of boulders whilst I lunged for a large shrub growing stubbornly by the freezing water. I didn't see at that time where Alexander went. Once hidden, I turned to see if the creature had seen me, might perhaps even now be bearing down on me, but it was not. Semyon had slipped in the water and he was trying to drag himself away. I could hear his whimpering and cries from where I hid. I could also see the creature for the first time. It was tall and thin. Human-like, I guess, but wrong in too many ways. In the moonlight, I could make out unnaturally long limbs, jutting bones. Its face wasn't too clear, though I thought I could make out dark holes where eyes and mouth might be. It was bearing down on Semyon, who had twisted round to face his attacker. Brave man. The thing leaned down towards him and screamed. The noise was worse than before, again with that strange split of high and low resonance. 
With wide eyes, I saw Semyon's face contort in pain. And then I looked away, squeezing my eyes shut. I heard a dull crack, like the crunch of bones, and then silence. I peered out. Semyon was slumped back in the water. Dead, I had no doubt. The thing was standing where I'd seen it last, its back to me. It was unnaturally still, like a statue. I glanced over to the boulders where I had seen Lyudmila, and I saw her, peeping out as I was, her eyes on the monster. I realized immediately that she intended to run. Her cover was not as good as mine, and it was as apparent to her as to me that if the creature turned her way, she would not be hidden. She carefully moved back. Whether the creature had supernatural hearing or some other unknown sense, it turned immediately, those dark holes of eyes seeking Lyudmila out. She screamed and turned to run, but good God, it moved so fast. Those freakish limbs eating up the ground between them, its spidery hands grabbing her arms, pulling her up in the air. For a second, it just stared at her face as she writhed in its grip and then gave its banshee wail. This time, I didn't look away. Though sheer terror has purged much of what I saw from my mind, but before I fainted, I remembered seeing her eyes and how they poured down her face. How I survived until morning, I'll never know. Though three fingers and most of my toes were the price I paid to the cold, I was luckier, though, than Alexander, who was found further down the creek, frozen, face down in the water, as it lapped gently against him. Of the creature... There was no sign. I made no attempt to return to the tent, and would likely have perished like my companions had I not eventually stumbled upon a somewhat shocked tribe of Mansi, who saved my life and to whom I am forever indebted. Until today, I have never shared this story. My status as a fugitive from the law would have made me unwilling to divulge my involvement, even if the story had not been so unbelievable and the government so eager to cover up what aspects of it they could. Though mostly, it's because I do not wish to relive it. I've had such nightmares as it is of the creature, of Liedmila's face, and of the details I learned later from the investigations, the families don't need to know what truly occurred. Let them believe it was just an unfortunate accident. I know enough of you, sir, to have no reason to believe in your goodness. But I'm an old woman now, who is not likely to see many more summers. If I could prevail on you to keep this account hidden until I am no longer around to confirm nor deny it, then you would be doing me a great kindness. Let the dead rest, sir. Though from what I know of you, I fear my pleas fall on deaf ears. Yours, Elizaveta Sokolova. It asked us as it cuts deep into the inner thigh, flesh and fat zippering apart, its tongue probing into the fresh wound. How are you doing? The thing wouldn't want an answer even if there was one. It only wants screams. This is going to be worth it. You're going to love next year. This will make it 
worth the having. I used to wonder what could be worth this. The heat of its palms pushing legs apart. The cold, slow rivulets of saliva dripping down like icy syrup, washed away with slow impulses of hot blood. That single tooth in its lower jaw, barbed and cursed. That awful, knowing smile from the puckered sphincter of its mouth. This year, I finally understand that phrase. Worth the having. This year, the final year of our horrible agreement. The thing still uses that word, agreement, as if I wanted any of this. I understand it all. Twenty-two years ago, I cut across the backyard of Mikey Slater's dad's house. This was the night before Halloween. The night I'd later learn that thing would stretch its legs and go for a walk. The thing was the reason for the season. The whole tradition of Halloween had started because of it. Masks, costumes, disguises, none of it for fun. All of it primal camouflage to help the prey hide from the predator. Nobody remembers that part of the tradition anymore. Not even the thing itself. It just knows to walk the night before Halloween. And it walks to me. I don't ask where it goes when it leaves me or what it does on Halloween night. I'm just glad it's gone. Anyway, Mikey Slater. His parents had been divorced a few years and I treated our hangout like a second home. The other bonus was that it was a quick end around the neighborhood when I needed to get home fast. I was on my way home from checking out Mikey's Halloween costume at his mom's house and had about two minutes to get home before dinner was cold and my ass would get spanked. We'd made a pact to dress as characters from this cartoon about interstellar nights. We had some great things rigged to our costumes, lights and fake swords, the whole works. We expected that tomorrow night we'd barely be able to do any trick-or-treating since we'd be mobbed by admirers wondering how we obtained these amazing costumes. I vaulted the six-foot wooden slatted fence, landed softly in the garden, not caring if my presence was announced or not since Mikey's dad never cared if I cut through. And then I saw Mr. Slater lying in the grass near the back door, naked. Another person straddled him, pinning his arms down. Pale skin, soft curves, it looked like a woman. The back did anyway. The head was too small and bald with a mohawk of downy feathers. And this thing, this silhouette dipped down the head bobbing just above Mr. Slater's crotch. I was young, but not so young that I didn't have a small clue about what I might be seeing. I heard a whisper. Almost done. Almost done. Next year is going to be fantastic. This will all be worth it. And Mr. Slater replied. <laughs> no. No, no, no more. There's nothing I want. Everything I want is gone. Occasionally he hissed, his breath stifling a scream. Pleasure wasn't part of this. No more. No more, please. You must want something. It's you and I forever. If you don't want anything. And here the naked thing yanked a hand back from Mr. Slater's thigh. And that's when I noticed the blood and the flap of flayed skin that I'd initially mistaken for underwear pulled down. I tried to turn around, grab the fence to bail out. I wanted to get out of there, wanted to be home. You what? It whipped its head around at me and I felt its voice in my head more than I heard it. <laughs> Take him! Take him! Mr. Slater cried out, pointing at me. 
I can't explain any of what happened next. Can't explain the face I saw when I locked eyes with the thing. Can't explain the speed with which it moved. It crossed the yard in three hitching strides, seizing my ankles as I tried to get out of the yard. I flopped my upper body over the fence and struggled for anything to grab, to pull, to get free. I heard a whisper. No, felt it. One quick bite on my ankle. A burning pain, searing, electric. Make a wish before you go to bed. Think about what you want next year more than anything. We have an agreement now. It wasn't a question or an offer. It released me and I dropped to the ground in the alley behind the fence. I reached to my ankle. There was a fading flash of pain and burning, but no blood, no cut. Mikey's dad came stumbling around the corner, wearing nothing but a pair of shorts, holding a handgun. Is it still here? Is it? I said nothing. What could I say? What the hell was happening? My God, if you hadn't shown up, I'd... I'm free. He smiled at me and turned away. There was a flash in his eyes, a moment where he was teetering between life and death. That gun, the fulcrum between finishing something very bad or starting something new. His hand rose slowly. But don't. Mikey. Those were the only three words in the mess behind my lips that could break through. It was enough. His hand swung free and heavy. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Try to. Just try to think of good things for yourself. He looked at the gun again. <laughs> what the hell was I going to do with this thing? <laughs> Don't ever think about trying to kill it. Whatever you do. Just take what you have coming, and then think of good things for yourself. <laughs> I barely remember getting home. By the time I was through my front door, the details were hazy. My ankle was fine. No cut, no scab, not even a scratch. I slid into bed, trying to remember the thing, the face, the hands, anything. But it was all gone. A haze. My gaze drifted over the shelves around my room. The random toys scattered around. The baseball bat leaning against the corner. I hopped out of bed and brought it close by, feeling like it would keep me safe, not knowing from what. As I drifted off that night, my last thought was about Little League and my wish that I wasn't too damn fat to play shortstop. That's good enough. A whisper shot through the center of my brain. Cold sweat broke over my upper lip, then calmness, then sleep. When I woke up the next morning, I'd forgotten the previous night completely. I was full of energy, light on my feet. I felt ready to take on the world. Things felt a little darker in the afternoon as I walked by Mr. Slater's house on my way to Mikey's, but I couldn't quite peg why. I saw him sitting on his porch, a strange smile on his face. I kept moving, and that night was a Halloween much like any other. The following year I dropped a lot of weight, got faster, made the team. Didn't think of how or why, just attributed it to hard work and eating right. Then early October came, and I found a postcard on my pillow when I got home from school. I'd like to say I got cold chills when I picked it up, or that it felt like flesh or leathery hide. But no, just plain cheap cardboard, typed in a neat white font on one side. It read, 
Halloween is almost here. Did you have a good year? What do you want next year? Think hard. Make it worth the having. I wanted to show the card to my mom, but by the time she got home from work, it was gone. Every time anyone brought up Halloween, this icicle of dread would rocket down my spine and then disappear in a haze of thoughts about candy and costumes, an itch at the back of my mind that I couldn't quite scratch. The night before Halloween, playing my costume out before going to bed, my only thoughts were on candy and sneaking around in the dark. It was two in the morning when I woke to a great weight on top of me, pushing the blankets down tight and cocooning me inside. I opened my eyes to see a silhouette, slight shoulders that were a bit too sharp, full breasts that seemed too round, slender arms that pinned me down. It was too dark to see details. I tried to cry out for my parents, but the thing lifted a hand to my mouth, cold, boneless fingers clamping down. The palm spread like cold jelly as the thing drew its hand back forcing one, then two fingers into my mouth. There was a texture to the bottom of them, something between a snake's belly and octopus suction pads. The whisper in my brain. Have you thought on it? Thought on what? The postcard I sent. What you want for next year? Who are you? It doesn't matter who I am. It matters who you are. You are mine. How did you... Just as you hear me in your mind, I hear you in mine. You are mine. What does that mean? It means... You are mine. I felt the thing rock down with its pelvis, grind into my stomach. The agreement is not without benefit to you. I didn't agree to anything. Does a fish agree to feed a shark? Does a tree agree to be struck by lightning? You are mine. The thing drew closer to me, and I squeezed my eyes shut. Everything grew bright until I could make out shapes, then colors. Then I could see it in front of me. You don't need your ears to hear me, nor your eyes to see. You are mine. It was mottled in gray. The torso was curved and sensuous. But the head, that too small head, the puckered sphincter of a mouth that prolapsed in and out, exposing that single jagged tooth. The two giant eyes, bulbous and red, shot with veins but no pupils. The two smaller green eyes in between. No ears, no nose. The tuft of white feathers in a stripe over the shining bald skull. Squeezing my eyes shut tighter only seemed to draw out more clarity. You need to understand how this works. I will show you. Think of a woman you desire. I couldn't. I was twelve. There wasn't desire yet, only a strange fascination. An occasional stern if I saw a woman on TV in a swimsuit or that time I sneaked a peek at my dad's private magazine collection. The thing on top of me changed. Hair grew. The head filled in. The face melted and morphed into the perfectly sculpted features of that lady from Beach Patrol who had just done the cover shoot for Playboy. Bronze skin, swaying breasts, 
a sculpted collarbone, skin coated in a sheen of sweat, just as I'd seen her in the centerfold. Better. It hadn't changed the feeling of the fingers in my mouth, cold like snails, twitching and probing around my tongue. Every year on this night, I'm going to find you. I must feed. In exchange, you will tell me something you want. And over the course of the next year, you, you shall have it. But I don't want... You are... And the fingers extended slowly, pushing against the back of my throat, gagging me. Mine. Understand it. Tell me your desire. Make it worth the having. I want you to leave me alone. Not part of the bargain. Not your place to ask. You are mine. The fingers pushed deeper still until I could feel them sliding down into my throat. I couldn't breathe. Instinct kicked in and I began to thrash. I needed to escape. I bit down hard on the fingers, breaking the skin. Cold, peppery ichor oozing into my mouth. The thing didn't draw back. It moaned reached up with its other hand and caressed itself. More. It pushed hard on my mouth, wanting me to bite. I let my jaw go slack. It sighed, the kind of sigh I was too young to understand as sexually frustrated, and its fingers pulled back. I felt my lungs suck in air. I thought I was going to die. Thoughts of school crossed my mind. Thoughts of family trips I'd never get to take. I'd never get to see Disney World. Is that something you desire? I nodded in spite of myself. The thing on top of me slowly morphed back to its original form, spinning around on my body so I could only see its back. I felt it pulling at the sheets covering my feet. I want you to think harder next year. Make it good. Make it worth the having. This is scarcely worth a toe. Let alone two. What? What? And I felt the cold fingers of one hand clamp down on my ankle while the other fingers slithered down between my toes, constricting them, spreading them apart. No. I said. No, 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 no. Please don't. Next year you will remember this and understand what it means when I say make it worth the having. Its head lowered and its lips wrapped around my big toe. It sucked once, twice, then clamped down with a force I can't describe. That single tooth razored into the meat of my toe and flicked, cutting, tearing. I screamed. I had to have screamed, but there was no sound. I could feel the blood pumping out of my toe, feel the vibrations of serrated tooth on bone, clamping, twisting, pulling, until until it was all electricity and cold air. The thing turned to me and pursed its lips. It showed me my toe, sucking it so it bobbed in and out of its mouth before tipping its head back and swallowing. The opening between its legs pulsed and shuddered, cold slime pulling onto my sheets. It sighed. What? More. This time I did get a scream out. A small yelp as it latched onto my second toe and began chewing again. 
Its leg cracked and bent around at an impossible angle until its foot was over my mouth, spreading like taffy, covering my nose and lips so that no sound could escape. No breath could enter. There was no smell, just electric pain, vibrant agony, a crack, a tear, and more cold air. The second toe went much easier than the first. The creature arched its back and swallowed, ripples shivering down its flanks as it came again. It spun, bringing its face close to mine. I squeezed my eyes shut to no effect. Enjoy your trip. Next year, think harder. Without moving its torso, it raised one leg, stretched it toward my window sill. Gripping hard, it pulled itself up and out into the night. I stared down over my soaked sheets at my foot. The silhouette in the dark room danced through the purple lightning of pain. It didn't seem to be bleeding. It didn't hurt. I didn't pass out from the pain. I passed out when I tried to count my toes and had to stop at three. I awoke screaming as I felt someone shaking my shoulder. Unbidden, I saw that face, round and leathery and purple, hovering inches from mine. Honey, it's okay. When I opened my eyes, I saw my mother's face. Are you feeling okay? Your bed is soaked. Did you wet the bed? I burst into tears, kicking at the sheets until they came free. I could feel the burning sensation in my toes still, the raw wound scraping at the fabric. No! I shouted. Look what it did! Look what it did! I held my foot up. Five toes. Had I not already been crying, I might have started then. Or possibly even wet the bed out of sheer joy. I wiggled my toes, jumped out of bed. What's gotten into you? My big toe was a bit red. My second toe had a definite hard ridge beneath the skin like a scar. But they were there. They were back. I was whole. My toes were... Mine. Mine. Did you stub your toe last night? My mom grabbed my foot, poking at my toes. No pain. No, I'm... Ow! There was a scab on the underside of my big toe. Damp sheets. No blood. Five toes. You need to get up and be more careful. You get a cut like that, you show me, okay? Otherwise, it could get infected and you might lose your toes. You wouldn't want that, would you? I blanched. You need to get up. It's Halloween. Big breakfast to fuel up for a big night, right? Her hands sank into the dampness on my sheet. The essence that the creature had left behind in its ecstasy. Her eyes became vacant, distant, as she pulled the sheet off and bunched them on the floor. Well... I'll wash these later. You go run along. She absently licked at her fingers as she left. By the time I made it downstairs for breakfast, I'd forgotten about my aching toes. By the time I was out the door, my sheets were in the wash and my mind was on Halloween. The events of the evening never returned to traumatize me. I don't remember much of the school year that followed, but I remember our vacation. The best we had ever had as a family. I remember years later my parents telling me that the trip had been a new beginning for them, bringing them out of a rough patch that I had been blissfully unaware of. The next year when Halloween drew close, I got another card. This time in my lunchbox at school. Matt Black bearing only the reminder. Make it worth the having. Reading those words instantly sent a spasm of pain through my foot and up my spine. I couldn't see the creature in mine, but it was omnipresent. That assault, that pain, and the reward it brought. The night before Halloween that year, I asked if I could sleep in my parents' room. 
and as soon as the question left my mouth, a whisper buzzed through my brain. Oh no, don't make them watch. Why would you do that to them? So I didn't. I slept in my closet that year thinking it might not find me, but I was wrong. I could explain this, break it down year by year and tell what happened, but that's not what I'm going to do. It's about that phrase, make it worth the having. That second time, it stood at the door of my closet, towering over me, taking on features it must have thought looked friendly. The face shifting from Santa Claus to Jesus to cartoon mice and rabbits. I don't want you to go through this for nothing. Think big. Please stop. I'll stop when I'm full and finished. And I'll still come back next year. Don't wish for toys. Don't wish for things for other people. Think of yourself. Remember our meeting last year. And know what's about to happen will be far worse than a few toes. Don't let this happen for nothing. Make it worth the- I screamed hard, muffled by the gelatinous glob of fingers it had forced into my mouth again. I just wanted it to shut up. I never wanted to hear that phrase again, but I knew I would. I knew this. All of this would be happening again and again. That's a big burden to put on the shoulders of a child, right? Have almost anything you want in exchange for giving the thing what it wants. That's not accurate. In exchange for the thing taking what it wants. I mean, what can a child think of that would be worth that? The second year, all I could think of was sports cars. It made me try again. Why well, ask for something I couldn't legally use? Millions of dollars? Same thing. It had to be personal. So the second year I wished to be the fastest, strongest kid in my school. Done. And in exchange for that, for the next 60 minutes, the creature flayed my arms and legs with that horrible tooth peeled back my skin and chose three strands of exposed muscle from each limb, snapping them near one tendon and pulling them out like spaghetti, lifting it as high as it would go before placing the strand in its mouth and sucking it down greedily, biting off the other end at the tendon. It held its gelatinous foot over my mouth the whole time tiny suction foot pads inhaling the screams that never made it into the night. Blood everywhere. Pain like I had never felt to that point anyway. When it was done, it left me wide open like a biology class project pinned to a tray, trying to sleep and failing miserably. I passed out at some point and woke up in the morning. Mildly sore but fully intact, testing out my newfound strength on my dad's weight bench by the end of the day. By the end of the week, I was running home from school without breaking a sweat. By the end of the school year, I was meddling in every sport I chose. When October rolled around and the black postcard fell out of a library book I pulled from the shelf, the sinking dread in my stomach was almost matched by the excitement of the next thing I planned to ask for. That night, it ate half of one of my kidneys. Once it managed to pull the organ free, it wasn't so bad. But getting there was sheer hell. Fourteen years old, I made the wish any hormonally rampaging boy would. And that year, I got every girl I was interested in. Was it worth it? Hard to say. But that year I came to understand that I was addicted. That I understood what worth the having meant. 
and that my life was going to improve. I thought I had it all figured out. I had to try something new, despite seeing the thing lick its lips, despite seeing the horrible tongue dance over that single stupid tooth and the puckered maw it called a mouth. Something new was too enticing to resist. Year by year, piece by piece, I was going to become a better man. Everything that's happened in my life is a bit of a blur, but not those nights. Those I have perfect clarity on. I got better than perfect eyesight the year it spent hours working my eyeballs free from the sockets after using one jagged nail to cut my eyelids off. More length and girth downstairs. It was my first year of college after all. That year was sheer torture. It changed its shape to a calendar girl, arousing me, bringing me to climax orally in spite of myself. The soft, supple features of the woman's body betrayed the cold, slimy oatmeal feeling of the thing's mouth and throat. And then came the pain. My member first peeled like a raw potato with that single hooked tooth, then the soft tissue torn free, then the tongue probing into the open wound at my crotch until my testes were pulled free from my body and eaten. No, nibbled, held daintily between thumb and forefinger with pinky extended until they were gone. That night I was on a camping trip, so the thing didn't even need to muffle my screams, and I obliged it until I was choking on my own vomit and my throat was raw. Physically, I was fine the next day, but it took me a few weeks to get the feeling of it all out of my mind. Once I did, I quickly developed a reputation as big man on campus in every way imaginable. By the end of the year, every woman worth having knew my number. After college, my life became career-oriented. Real estate, stock market, passive income. I wanted to be rich while having as much free time as possible to research because I needed to know how to finish this thing. Mikey's dad, all those years ago, had simply begged the creature to stop, and when it saw me, it did. I asked it one year if I could do the same thing. It only replied, You are mine. I researched it through college and beyond, and when I had enough money to hire people, they researched it too. I couldn't be very specific with them about my reasons, of course, but I could offer grants to religious studies students, hire paranormal investigators, demonologists. Six solid years of research yielded nothing, not a damn thing. Every ancient society, every dead culture I could study, I did, end to end, to the extent that there was some buzz that I'd be nominated for a Nobel for advancing the study so far. Nobody had heard of the thing. In college, I had the idea to go back and ask Mr. Slater about it, but he looked at me like I was crazy. I wondered how much time it had spent with him since his life wasn't so great. What if that was the first night he'd encountered it? What if the thing had been with him for years and was on a downswing, taking things away instead of granting them? I'd never know. I was 35, with another Halloween approaching, a wife I loved and my first child on the way, and that thing was the final straw. I couldn't have this thing in my life with a child in the house. This year, I was going to ask it for an exit. This year, I received something worse than a black postcard in the mail. This year, the afternoon of what I'd come to think of as visitation night, we had to rush to the hospital complications. Our baby was lost. It made no sense. My wife was perfectly healthy and everything had been going fine, but there was no heartbeat, no sign of life. My wife was inconsolable. She had to be sedated, and even as they were putting the IV into her, she was crying out, asking, Will this hurt the baby? You can't give me these drugs. It'll cause complications. My wife refused treatment, insisted that they were mistaken. We went home, 
the doctor pulling me aside to suggest that we let her rest a few days, then discuss inducing labor to finish the procedure. Finish the procedure. Just like that, our baby had somehow progressed from human being to benign growth. A mold to be scraped off. A boil to be lanced. All of those cardboard pumpkins hanging on the wall, smiling, calm. That stupid, friendly skeleton on the door. They were the only witnesses. That night it came. Slow, silent, and sad-eyed. It sat at the foot of the couch where I was sleeping. My wife wanted to be alone, and I didn't know what to do. I didn't notice that I'd drifted off to sleep, but one minute it wasn't there, and then it was. Laying a hand on my calf, I didn't feel fear. I only felt empty. I am ready. Just take something and go, I said. I am ready to end our bargain. I was speechless. It felt strange. Another gut punch. Another loss. Another branch pruned from the tree of my life. I wanted to dictate terms. I wanted a safe exit. But once the baby was gone, I wanted it back. I wanted it to continue. I needed this thing. This surety. <sighs> I will give you your child. What? I will give you your child. I will take it. I will be the surrogate. Tomorrow you will be a father. It wasn't a question or an offer. But my wife can't. She will remember nothing. I don't want this. You can't have it, my child. You can't. It's done. Have I ever asked your permission for anything? The bargain ends because I say so. You are mine. Tomorrow. You will be a father. It led me to the bedroom, made me open the door, made sure my wife. I can't describe the look I saw on her face, how she instinctively curled her arms over her stomach, how her feral glare burned through me until it came into the room. Then she froze and softened and looked at me, her lower jaw working, trying to get out a question to ask me what was happening. It mounted her, stretching its arms out and wrapped those rubbery cold fingers around her wrists, pinned her legs down, didn't bother to cover her mouth because there was nobody to disturb with her screams. All I could do was watch, and I knew what it felt like. I knew exactly what she was going through. I chuckled in spite of myself that she'd never be able to hold the pain of this childbirth over my head. That single tooth tore her nightshirt open. That sphincter mouth traced kisses down her collarbone, between her breasts, suckling at her nipples until milk started to flow. Then it moved lower. Elbows and shoulders dislocating so it could keep her pinned down. Not that she was fighting at this point. Only staring at me with wide eyes. Panting for air until the thing's mouth reached her thighs. How does it feel? It asks this as it cuts deep into the inner thigh. Flesh and fat zippering apart. Its tongue probing into the fresh wound. How are you doing? The thing wouldn't want an answer even if there was one. It only wants screams. 
This is going to be worth it. You're going to love next year. This will make it worth the having. Its head stretched thin, narrowing impossibly at the mouth. The entire face a tubular beak, a hard proboscis that poked at her vulva until it found its way inside. She screamed then, my wife. I couldn't do nothing but watch it root, the heat of its palms pushing her legs apart. The cold, slow rivulets of saliva dripping down her sides like icy syrup, washed away with the regular and slow pulses of her hot blood. That single tooth in her lower jaw, barbed and curved, that awful knowing smile from the pucker of its mouth as it comes up for air, slowly retracting its head to stare at me. Neck bent round the wrong way, slime coating its face. It made that hideous ring mouth into an imitation of a smile. It's a boy. It plunged its beak into her stomach, slicing through skin and fat and muscle, splaying her open. Cold gray slime oozed down her, mixing and pulling with her blood. That ringing, that ringing in my ears isn't ringing, it's her screaming. Screaming for the baby, screaming no, screaming my name, cursing me even as it lowered its face to her flayed abdomen and forced its head inside. Its back lurched up once, twice, as if taking great gulp and swallows. And then it came, orgasmic shudders rippling through its spine as it straightened and stood up from the bed, staring at me, one hand cupping its swollen belly. It caressed my cheek, pushed a finger inside my mouth, pressed until my knees buckled. It lowered me onto the bed beside my wife. Tears streamed from her eyes, her organs warm and wet against my stomach. I reached out to her, stupidly, tried to cradle her in my arms. The thing stood above us and arched its back, convulsing, straining, eyes swelling until the veins that laced them burst and bloody tears flowed. It straddled her, crouching lower and lower until it positioned its vagina above my wife's open torso. It pushed, pushed until it came, until a child came. A membranous sack slid out of its dilated opening and landed inside my wife. I saw through the pale pink membrane its face, calm and serene, sleeping, sleeping. I woke to her screams, my wife clutching my arm and saying, It's time! Holy shit, it's time! They were wrong! My water broke! Do you feel it? I climbed from the bed, soaked, but not in her blood, but amniotic fluid. Aside from that, the sheets were clean in a way my memory could never be. And we drove to the hospital, and I strode through the doors like a champion pushing her wheelchair through the throng gathered there. I stared at the confused faces of the nurses and doctors and told them it was time. They checked signs. They double-checked charts. They made me sign waivers promising not to sue over all the stillbirth confusion. These things happen sometimes. We will, of course, be paying you for your pain and suffering in exchange for... I told them to shut the fuck up and do their job. We could discuss it later. There would be a later. There would be a rest of our lives and that's all that mattered. You are all that mattered. Our son. My son. Mine. I'm telling you all of this now before you understand it. Because I never want you to hear it again. I never want you to know about any of this. It's gone. It's gone and it won't come back. It always keeps its promises. You're in my arms with your perfect eyes, your ruddy cheeks, and I love you. More than anything, 
more than everything. I'm laughing at your gurgles, your tiny nose twitching, your perfect little ruby lips when they stretch into that smile, that same kind of goofy smile your mother gets, your happy little gummy mouth that looks perfect, perfect and normal, except for that one thing that confused the doctors. That single, smooth, tiny tooth breaking through your lower gums. And doctors say this isn't unusual. They call them natal teeth. I know better. You yawn wide, showing me that tiny ivory blade. And you stare at me placidly. And I can only think. Worth the heaven. My name's Noah O'Reilly, and I like to burn things. It had all started when I was nine, after my parents separated. Custody was granted to my mother, since my father had taken the opportunity to jump ship, probably to start a new family with the tard he had an affair with. It took my mother less than a year to catch another man's fancy, one that went from boyfriend to fiancé in record time. My new stepfather had no interest in children. The longer they were together, the more my mother's focus strayed away from her son to keep her new love plump and happy. Having no friends at school and no desire to be home, I often wandered aimlessly. I enjoyed finding anthills and reflecting the sunlight with my chipped magnifying glass, burning them until their little bodies went Pop. Sometimes the head survived. It was on a day like that, on my way back home, that I found a tiny discarded box at the park. Five little matches were inside. I struck one, just like they do in the movies. The small tongue of the flame amused me. It was a nice, tingly feeling. I used two matches on two separate days that week, burning chunks of paper in the backyard. It helped me feel better when the days got hard, as though I were burning that day away. Good riddance. God knows I couldn't turn to my mother. Her thoughts were always somewhere else, a place where I didn't matter. Of course, when I used the last match on her new carpet, it caught her attention. She forced me to attend a treatment program for young fire starters. It didn't come home with me. It was 2, maybe 3 a.m. on a Tuesday, when I cut across the vacant parking lot, every step as furtive as possible. I was 18 then. My eyes were locked on the target, a large industrial bin situated outside of a construction site. Impregnating its big red body was an overflow of trash that had accumulated over the week. Perfect, I thought, when I spotted it the night before. Simply perfect. Not far from home, not too close either. I ducked behind the bin. A deep exhale seeped out of my lungs. What a thrill! like a buried seed deep inside myself, finally cracking open. For years I'd cultivated that seed. Even as a young boy, I'd burn broken toys or I'd toss firecrackers in mailboxes. Never once caught, mind you. The only good thing that came out of the middle school for me was learning how to make a flamethrower. All you needed was a can of aerosol spray and a lighter discovery that led to the permanent scar over my left eye and a lack of eyebrows. Nothing ventured, nothing gained. Pulling a white container out of my jacket, I squeezed an arc of colorless liquid over the bin's contents. I circled the red rectangular body four times, soaking as much of the compacted waste as possible. Then the coup de grace. I pulled a box of matches from my jacket. 
igniting one of them on the striker, I couldn't help but take a moment to appreciate it, how the small flames swayed and danced in the air. With a sharp flick of my finger, I tossed the flame into the marinated pile. There was a whoosh, followed by a burst of light. The fire erupted out of its throat in a borealis of orange and yellow. I was in awe, mentally fixated by the growing kindle, the deep crackling sounds, the new scent scarring the air. At that moment, I knew what true pleasure felt like. Unfortunately for me, the pleasure would be short-lived. While mesmerized by my creation, I'd failed to notice a different set of lights pulled up behind me. On the ground, hands where I could see them. Two officers approached, their weapons drawn. I followed their orders. It was too late to run. My head was pressed firmly against the asphalt. My wrists choked with handcuffs. Still, I did not allow the dancing embers to leave my eyes. I was given six years, four in prison, and two on supervised license. My first cellmate was tall, bald, Somewhere in his thirties and missing an eye. The glass eye he once had was confiscated after he was caught trying to smuggle in illegal substances within the socket. He called it his secret pocket. It was evident that I had never done time before, and he took it upon himself to show me some tricks of the trade. Cellmates I would have down the road were never as eccentric but thankfully not problematic. The doors unlocked every morning at quarter to eight. I was kept from kitchen duty and only given tasks that it didn't include fire. Most of the time, laundry service or warehouse duty. The day-to-day -day jobs were menial and mundane, but better than sitting in a cell with the dullness gnawing at your skull. Nights were the most difficult. Sleep felt like it was an entirely different span of existence. I could only sit there, listening to the echoing footsteps, the awful snoring from the top bunk, and the hysterical wails from the psych units. But those weren't what kept my thoughts so active. It was the withdrawal. I'd have killed to see that blaze again, how it swelled like a fiery cloud, I would whip tendrils of smoke into the air. Instead, I was trapped, shivering, and dribbling with sweat begging for that same release. On the day I was discharged, they sent me on my way with $75 in my pocket. The sky never looked so blue that day. Finding a job can be difficult for anyone, but for an ex-con, it was, well, close to impossible, unless you had connections. And give that ex-con dark skin, a scar above his eyes and no left eyebrows. Uh, they may as well be hiring Freddy fucking Kruger. I answered countless ads, collected a heap of applications, and rewrote my resume dozens of times to make it look decent enough. But no amount of polish could soften the blow of the question. Have you ever been convicted of a crime? Check no to be considered... Check yes to be tossed into the furnace. There was no deal breaker. Don't call us, we'll call you. Freedom is good, but it wasn't long before I realized that the sentence didn't end when the gates opened. Despite the stigmatized cross I was forced to bear, there were always silver linings. When your brain must adapt to years inside of a bared-up box... It finds any hopeful prospect to cling to. My mother had left me in her apartment and whining lemon of a car. Every room smelled like musty perfume fused with old candle wax. The bed was painfully hard and springy. The ever-building worry rolled around inside of me like a pocket of gas, trapped inside a piece of coal. Just one light, only one small piece of charred paper in the parking lot would be enough to get me through the week. Still, I re resisted the urges. 
I'd successfully eluded it for years now, thanks to time and a lot of behavioral therapy. Whenever the seed started to burn, I knew how to extinguish the flare. Miraculously, I was able to land an interview. The hiring position was for a graveyard shift at Hitchhiker's Haven, a family-owned gas station run by a man named Bennett Crawford. I rehearsed the interview dozens of times, drawing up every possible question I'd be asked, and a golden answer to counter them. Hitchhiker's Haven sat along a rural stretch of road between Redmond and Sisters, the two closest towns for miles. Rolling green hills and farmland pastures surrounded it. The faded blue peaks of the Cascades were outlined in the distance like paintings. I met with Crawford, who insisted on being called Ben. The man was no grease monkey, which is what I had envisioned a gas station owner to be. His deep-set eyes were green and placid. The wide Cheshire grin he wore throughout the meeting didn't waver. I'm sorry for this, Ben started, which made my heart begin to sink. But I have to ask you, what landed you in the iron pen? The question was inevitable, but still startling. I bit the inside of his cheek. Third-degree arson, sir. Ben's genuine, beatific expression didn't fade. Tried to burn your last boss's house to the ground, eh? I rolled my shoulders back. Oh, no, sir. I'd never do anything like that, but after what he said to me, I knew I could never work for him again. What did he say? He fired. Ben suddenly looked surprised and chuckled at my joke. I'll give you a pass on that one. If there is one thing I respect in a man, it's a sense of humor. The interview surely ended after that, and we both shook hands. I like you, Noah. You have a nice light to you. Be it the demeanor you carry or that cheeky tongue of yours, I feel you'll be a good fit for us. So what do you say? You want the job? I blinked, almost blurting out, That's a fucking lootly but instead settled on, yes, sir. Then came the question I had spent sleepless nights waiting for. When can you start? The sooner the better, boss. My first night shift started that evening at ten. Outside the metal canopy looming over the pumps bathed the lot in a fluorescent green glow. It was eerie, uh, like a ghostly light guiding you from the dark stretch of road to an isolated gas station. Why Ben chose that color was beyond me. Not a very inviting glow for hitchhikers. I was given my uniform, a gray shirt sleeve shirt with HH printed in bold, lining perfectly over the left tit. Each aisle was four feet wide, arranged in a grid formation across the interior. Not as big as the competitors, but just as convenient. Each of the multi-sided racks was stacked with assorted products, from ships and candy to on-the-road vehicle supplies and accessories. LED cooler doors lined the wall across from the register, filled with their assortment of drinks. A plastic mat rested on the counter, designed like a map of Deschutes County. Dominating the counter space was a box of jawbreakers, a small stand of keychains and a rack of colorful lighters I knew I'd have to ignore. Ben's grand tour lasted 30 minutes. We went over the nightly responsibilities, operating the register, restocking shelves and coolers, replacing the bags in the outdoor ice machine, and managing a clean workspace. So, Ben said, with a slanted look in his eye, think you can manage something like this? I gestured to my notes. I'll be all right. Good, he smiled, which quickly melted into a ruminating expression. Given your history, I should hope you weren't one of the crazies. I raised a non-existent eyebrow. Uh, what do you mean? The workers I hire for the night shift are good most of the time, but once in a while you get one of the crazies. Honestly, you wouldn't believe some of the tales people try to sell me here. Either way, here's to hoping, son. His face held the vague nuance that there was more to say, but instead 
He nodded goodbye and left for a good night's sleep. Hours into my shift, at roughly three in the morning, a set of headlights slid off the road and into the lot. Four young silhouettes sauntered inside. None of them could have been more than seventeen or eighteen. One of the teens, a gauntly-looking one, who wore his hair like a young Kurt Cobain, led the quartet to the snack aisle. Periodically, a few of them erupted into a distinct high-pitched squeal of laughter, like a pack of hyenas. Each of them grabbed a stash of junk foods and formed a mountain on the counter. Cobain covered the bill, his pupils as big as hockey pucks. Something about his glazed, absent-minded expression filled me with bittersweet nostalgia. I thought about the old days when life felt so much larger than a box. Then I thought about the industrial bin and the beautiful fire spewing out of its melting gullet. Then I stopped myself. The other nights that week went as precisely as I pictured it, slow and dead. A few faces would occasionally pop in and out, but for the rest of the time, Hitchhiker's Haven was a ghost lot dipped in green. I didn't mind the boredom. The pay here was good. The confinement coldly familiar. I felt like a member of society again, like the word C-O-N-V-I-C-T was no longer seared onto my forehead. But night owl or not, the weight of deprivation fell heavily on me, which is what happens when one fucks with their circadian clock. To counteract the drowsiness, I often retraced all the items on my to-do list just to keep my mind and thoughts occupied. Clean. Check inventory stocks. Clean again. A scoured outline for survival tips. Ate healthier meals, sometimes. And dubbed caffeine my new god. Then, during one of those nights, it started to rain. Despite the forecast never mentioning a late-night shower, nor there being a speck of humidity in the air, the rain thrummed harshly against the windows and spilled over the canopy in small waterfalls. The automatic doors slid open, and a person inched their way inside. They were wearing a faded blue jacket with a hood pulled down, and their hands shoved in their pockets. They walked with a stiff gait, squeaking their wet shoes along the towels to the register. Beneath their hood, a white face stared at me, or rather, the suggestion of a face. A vague nose, no mouth whatsoever, and faint depressions where eyes should be. A creepy, non-distinctive mask. Any minute now, I'm going to have a gun shoved in my face. Any minute now, I thought unable to hide the apprehension in my face. The person raised one of their equally pale hands from their pockets, dropped change on the plastic mat, and reached for the box of jawbreakers. Their white, rigid fingers curved and almost seemed to lock as if they lifted it out by the plastic wrapper. The bundle of wet quarters and pennies had left me glinted from the overhead lights. The exact change for a jawbreaker. His candy in hand, he turned around and walked stiffly back to the door, tracing every waterprint. When the door slid closed behind him, his vague outline passed between the green tinged pumps and sank into the night's dark pellicle. I let out an eased breath, thankful he hadn't whipped out a gun from his pocket and demanded everything from the register. But that didn't explain the mask. Why wear something like that if you weren't going to rob the place? As I sat there and pondered it, I'd realized then the rain had ceased. It wasn't difficult to get my bearings back for the rest of the shift. In prison, you saw all kinds of weird shit and the crazies that go along with it. Was this what Ben had warned me about? I shrugged at the thought. Every nocturnal job had its sure freaks waiting for the sun to go down. Why would a lonesome gas station be any different? Whatever the case, I was confident I could stomach what Hitchhiker's Haven threw me. I'd hoped so, anyway. During another particularly dead hour with no customers, 
I busied myself with the second round of cleaning, everything in sight. It was either that or watch the coffee dribble into the pot. I moved the plastic mat off the counter, realizing I had never cleaned the dust beneath it. Something was written into the countertop, carved by way of a knife into its surface. Don't talk to it. I ran a finger along the deep grooves of the message, or rather, the warning. A week of normality passed before the next downpour. I was ringing up a few items, Advil and five-hour energy shots, for a red-eyed trucker. Together, we both heard the muffled applause of rain on the roof. Oh, we're shit. The man whined, crunching up his lip hair. You sell umbrellas, too? I shook my head. Sorry. He huffed and eyed the watery skim that dribbled down the windows. Bullshit weather. You just can't predict them, can you? He took his things and beelined toward the semi, veering back to the dark stretch of road. Once he left, the doors glided open once again. A faded blue jacket stepped inside, the same man from before. He approached the front desk one firm step at a time. A pungent whiff of damp clothes wafted off him, soaking wet again from the rain. Echoing the first time, his pale hand left his pocket and rested the wet change on the mat. Beneath his hood, the featureless face poked out, a sheen of light on his moist, non-existent expression, the same mask as before. Water dribbled off his fingers as he dropped the change, plucked out another jawbreaker, and returned to the exit, transparent footmarks trailing behind him. After that, the gray haze of boredom that once fogged the night shift was gone. Whether it was one week or every other week, the man always appeared. He'd saunter inside, completely waterlogged, leave the exact change, take a jawbreaker. Always a jawbreaker. The way he walked was especially strange to me, almost lifeless. Not in the undead sense, but more akin to a sleepwalker. As bizarre as it all was, the man wasn't especially difficult to deal with. Strange, yes, but not at all a hassle. In a minute, he'd walk in and then back to the heavy rain, returning to God knows where. Congratulations, Ben, you found yourself a regular customer. In addition to the already weird repetition of it all, there was something else I couldn't explain. Moments before the man arrived, on the dot, it would always rain. No matter how bone dry it was prior, the storm would come sudden and hard, only stopping after he left. Sometimes in minutes, other times in twenty. Too often for coincidence, but too crazily timed to be sane. Every so often, I'd lift the mat and stare at the words chiseled into the counter. Don't talk to it. Probably left by one of the last graveyard workers here. One of the crazies, as Ben put it. They were no doubt talking about Mr. No-Face, though calling him It seemed too dramatic. It must have really got to them. But a job was a job, and in my position, I was not apt for many preferences. I'd do what it takes to keep it. It wasn't long for the rain to come back harder than ever. The gas station's exterior moaned as the wind howled in an almost whisper through the slide doors. Without fail, the man walked in with his rigid gait, drenched. But when he reached the register, there was no change out of his pocket or jawbreaker, picked out of the box. This time was different, astray from the usual routine. He balled his rigid white fingers into a tight fist and slammed it against the plastic mat. Bam! The force shook the crown his flat surface, and vibrated the register. The countertop merchandise shivered in their displays. One of the keychains fell from their stand, a gray cat winking at me. Before I could react, the ashen-toned fist rose again and fiercely dropped. Bam! The standaliters toppled into the side of the counter, their transparent bodies scattering near my feet. Then, from the still plaster wall face... 
a hollow voice spoke out that left a sharp ringing in the air, as though it were made of glass. Would you like to see my face? What? The word blurted out of me, too late to reel back in. I was caught off guard, not expecting a question, let alone a sudden tantrum to come from him. At that moment, I'd broken the golden rule of Hitchhiker's Haven, carved gravely into its bedrock. The man stood there only a moment longer before the parts of his blank face began to move. His pale cheeks, the vague nose, both eye depression extended outward, moving aside like an insect's plated skin. Beneath them, a gaping space sank inward like a tunnel, its walls layered and glistening with a twitching blackish mold, a never-ending throat where white fragments of light pulsated like trapped stars. My eyes went vacant. I couldn't stop staring at them. A sense of distress raced down my spine. I could feel the cords of my neck straining to make me turn my head, but it wouldn't budge. The lights within its mildewy void gleamed in rich, beckoning textures. A universe of deep colors that wanted me. Every thought, every particle of myself. And for a moment, I felt myself starting to sink into its depths. But something kept me tethered. Something starved and soaked in kerosene. I managed to tear my eyes away, grabbed a lighter and pulled a can of aerosol from one of the cabinets. Without thinking, I flicked on the small flame and pressed a finger on the can. A bright jet of orange reached out and fluttered over the cavernous pitch of its face. Whatever hellish material it was made out of caught immediately. Fire smothered its head and latched onto the faded jacket. It floundered backward, batting fruitlessly at the spreading flames. No screams came from it, but an awful high-pitched ringing was stabbing my ears. Thunder bellowed outside in an ululating rumble. It toppled over one of the aisles, lighting up all the bags and products around. Acrid burning odors filled the air, and admittedly, the hint of a smile crept up my lips. The rising smoke reached the fire sprinklers and set them off. Water ejected out of their flower-shaped heads and soaked the whole area. As the flames dampened, the blackened figure got back to its feet and hobbled through the exit. I moved to chase after it, but by the time I'd stepped out, it was gone, evaporating with the pouring rain. Tried as I have, there's no coming to terms with what transpired that night, or whatever demented thing I'd seen, it made my brain feel loose, slowly teetering between total numbness and a manic episode. Bennett Crawford did not believe me, nor did I expect him to, and did not hesitate to press charges for the damages. In the span of a single night, I joined the ranks of his book of crazies, Given my track record, I was labeled as a repeat offender, a new title for the pyromaniac. The hearing will be sometime next week, and until then, I can only wait until the gavel comes down. I still dream about those colors sometime, like they're still imprinted somewhere in my consciousness, beckoning for me to go back there. Whatever it is they wanted from me, they are still calling Will the next person Ben hires see the man with no face? Or will it bide its time, waiting for the right stiff to pop the question to, Would you like to see my face? Yes, show me your face. Show me those colors. So that I can burn them all again. Hitchhiker's Haven will go up in smoke when I'm through with it. Then where will you go? Wherever it is... I'm sure it'll be raining. Do you believe in miracles? It's Christmas, and this is the time of year folks invest in miracles. They hold out for them. 
something like an annual jubilee. No matter how bad the year, they hope that everything will somehow snap together and be made right with the winter solstice. Lovers hope for marriage. The homeless and brokenhearted hope for restitution. Sinners hope for redemption. People just hope. But we forget how there are some wrongs in the world that are so pronounced that even making them right would be, well, shall we say, less than heartwarming. Henry Beavers was trying to work his way through one such wrong. He was having a dickens of a time figuring out just who was responsible. They used to think he was responsible. But the more he retraced his steps, the more he found whispers of other steps. If you get me. His old house was at 1312 Elm, the quiet town of Fucky Wucky Falls. Oh, you heard right. The house was always boarded up by the time he could make another visit. He had to bring a special coffee to make things right. A couple of swigs and the dirty tile floor was shiny as glass. And there was Mary in the kitchen, making a tower of pancakes. There was buck Timmy at the table, eyes getting bigger with each pancake Mary stacked. And there came Henry, sliding down the banister from upstairs. Hundreds of invisible hands clapped and cheered. Color left the scene, and an upbeat melody played in the background. Good morning, Henry. Good morning, you worthless slut. Laughter howled from every direction. Oh, Henry, that was tasteless. Just like you're cooking. More laughter. Some hooting this time. Mary just swatted her hand in the air and got back to the pancakes. Hiya, Dad. Oh, shut up, you waste of time and health insurance. Why didn't your mom swallow you? How about I chop you up and put you in a stew so all of us have a shot at it? The invisible audience roared. It wasn't able to get a hold of itself for some time. Henry's head swam. It took him a while to be aware of the phone against his head. It was his boss, screaming as usual screaming about the poor quality of Henry's work and the last sandwich he made. Especially the sandwich. Damn it, beavers. A dead Siberian nun's stiff left breast had more sandwich-making skills in its nipple than in your whole overpaid body. And so forth. And so on. Each run, each go, each cycle. Henry just takes it. He lets his boss dump all his rage onto him over the phone, off the clock. There is no laugh track. The sinking sun casts reddish-orange rays through the kitchen window, painting Henry's face. At long last, the bully is finished, and the line clicks off. Forty-five minutes later, the hospital calls. They have Timmy. Why was he suddenly at the hospital? Why didn't he get a phone call for 45 goddamned minutes? The voice of the nurse over the phone begins to feel like knives. He can't keep listening. Then, the sun rises back up in the sky. His wife walks backward from the living room. Timmy spits up pancakes and rebuilds the tower. Mary throws them back in the pan, where they melt into batter. And it would all just start over again until it was time for more coffee. Henry would notice something else for every time he'd cycle through, get a hint of something more. But he was like a starving man finding a crumb a day, and it was only a matter of time before they would come and take him away again. He became aware of one of his feet that was constantly warm and sticky. Taking the shoe off released a blast of putrid air, The sock was all sorts of nauseating shades of grime. It had a face drawn on it, and permanent marker. Henry slid it off with a slurp and pushed his hand inside of it and brought the face to life. Hello, Henry. Hey, Mr. Comstocking. You made it out again. You're back on Old Elm Street again. Yep. The eyes of the sock turned sad. Still haven't cracked the case, huh? I've got a few more pieces of the puzzle, 
but they're too damn small. I'm running out of time. I'm cold. I'm hungry. I'm lonely. I can help you with the lonely part. Henry made the song wink at him. Detective James Spudsack reeled back in his chair when his brain processed what the phone was telling him. His bumpy brow was raised high, sending their coarse follicles every which way, as if they were made of skin transplanted from his scrotum. Jesus and mustard, you don't say. You sure it was him? Thanks. Look into it. He clicked off his cell and jumped to his feet, relieving his poor chair of his great girth. Hey, Bollops! He yelled to his partner a few desks away. Guess you might have escaped from the nut nest again. Colin Pollops looked up with a mouthful of semi coffee logged donuts. His circumstances rendered him incapable of speech. Even so, Spotsack presumed that his <laughs> was the wrong answer, as usual. No, chumhead, Henry Beavers. Just got tipped that someone looking a lot like him is squatting in his old house again. <laughs> Well, I don't know how he keeps getting out. You expect me to do all the brain work? I just arrest people. Uh, hand me his case file 36, would you? Can't you... Just look it up in the database? Pollops asked, finally able to talk. Come on, you know how I work. Pollops rolled his eyes and reached for the briefcase under his desk. Case was a solid cube in its dimensions. Detective Spudsack had nothing but contempt for digital storage of information. He didn't want to be stuck with even the remote chance of a power outage that could deprive him of accessing valuable data. So, over the decades, he kept every note he had ever written in the briefcase. He wrote small, and never used anything larger than a sticky note. So, every case from his entire career fit nicely in that briefcase. Still... Sticky notes can be heavy in sufficient volume. Polyps threw his back out, carrying the case at least twice a month. He kept suggesting that the briefcase would benefit from some wheels. Spudsack kept suggesting that Polyps would benefit from getting the sand out of his vagina. He dug out several sticky notes held together with a paper clip and handed them to Spudsack. Polyps kept suggesting that the paper clips were redundant since they are sticky notes. Spudsap kept suggesting, well, you know. Henry zipped up his pants with trembling hands. He always felt a little guilty after the fact, but his relationship with Mr. Comstocking was the most stable thing in his life. Hell, it was the only stable thing in his life. He brushed away the temptation to smell his hand. Better get a drink of water, they grumbled. Get one for me, too. Henry wheeled around. He saw nobody. Who's there? Show yourself. The sock slowly lifted itself into the air and fixed Henry with its unblinking eyes. It laughed a thickly gurgled chuckle. After all that, Henry, you can't think of getting me a drink on your own? Henry gaped in awe. How? How is this possible? My special coffee should be out of my system by now. Well, aside from the fact that you're stark raving bonkers, you've been dumping the souls of your unborn children into me ever since this place got foreclosed. You've been filling me with life, Henry. I'm finally full. I don't know what to say. I say it's time for a second set of eyes in your quest. Drink your coffee. Henry smiled, bug-eyed. He slid down the banister to the cheers of the invisible crowd. Mary was making pancakes. Good morning, Mary. Who is she, Henry? She replied in a cold voice. What? We haven't had sex in weeks, Henry. I want to know who she is. Jesus, Mary. And Joseph, the sock gurgled. 
The audience bellowed with laughter. I'm not sleeping with anyone. Work's been a real pain, okay? Maybe it's time to tell your boss what your work is doing to your family. My work is supporting my family. Thank you very much. Life support isn't living, Henry. When's the last time you were at one of Timmy's ball games? Right? You haven't been to one. Not a single one. Uh, uh, well, fine. I'll quit my job and we'll live off what you make. Oh, uh, what's that you say? You don't have a job? Well, there goes that idea. Back to you. If taking care of you wasn't such a project, I'd get a job in a heartbeat. Henry suddenly noticed that Timmy wasn't at the table. Say, where's the kid? Mary shivered. Don't act like you care now. I just asked a fucking question. Where's Timmy? He's staying at Grandma Beaver's farm for a few days for a school project. At least your mom is interested in helping him with school. Unlike you. He's living at Mom's farm and nobody told me? Henry jumped at the sudden sound of the phone in his ear. Somebody screaming about a sandwich. It was his boss. The man never stopped yelling. Somehow, he was more bearable than Mary. Then, there was the call from the hospital. The world froze. The birds in the sky were anchored in place. The grass stopped swaying. The evening clouds were locked. Henry looked at the sock with tired, pleading eyes. This is as far as I get, each time. Something must have happened while you were on the phone. We'll have to see the police, the song rasped. Are you crazy? The police are looking for me. I said, we'll have to see the police, not talk to the police. We'll have to divert their attention for a few minutes. Henry cocked his head to one side. Curious. Fucky Wucky Falls couldn't hide the fact that they didn't have much pride in any of their schools. True, you could trek from California to the tip of Maine and never find a school that hits all the marks. But the schools of Fucky Wucky Falls hit the least. Especially Dairy Elementary. Most of the faculty were staggeringly incompetent. Nobody wanted to work there, so there were no replacements. The kitchen crew was a team of one a flabby-armed woman named Helga. She started going senile when she was 36, and English was not her native tongue. So, when she saw the name Dairy Elementary, she misread it as dairy, as in milk, and stocked the cafeteria with nothing but dairy products. Yogurt, cheese, milk, ice cream, and so forth. Her peers tried to correct her every week, but it would slip her memory. And so, the cycle would repeat itself. The cycle was nearing the 37-year mark. Between the calorie intake, the constipation, and the statistical lactose intolerance, all the dairy students were rotund. No reference was needed for playing tag. As soon as you put your hands on someone, they farted in alarm. Henry approached the snowy school grounds at recess, He watched bloated children tackle each other and trigger blasts of noise. He stood at the fence for a moment, noting how much warmer it was this close to the kids. Very few children could fit on the swings. Most of them clambered about the plastic castle with its tubes and platforms. He wondered how none of them got stuck. He took a deep breath and donned a bright smile. Hey, fat kid, he yelled. Every single child stopped and looked at him. Time to burn some calories! He lobbed a Molotov cocktail at the castle. It struck against the aluminum monkey bars. Blue flames scattered and turned orange, spreading in a tide of destruction. The children went up like paper mache and soon resembled a herd of roasting meatballs with legs. Henry clapped his hands and sang... One little, two little frying fat asses. Three little, four little frying fat asses. 
The percentage of children that remembered to stop, drop, and roll was most unfortunate. Turned out they could only stop, drop, and rock. Laying in the cool snow only made them burn slowly. Detective Spudsack and his partner were headed to Elm Street when their radio lit up. What? All the fat kids at Derry are burning? That's awful. There's nothing but fat kids at Derry. Will you shut up and get the hemorrhaging fuck over there? The dispatcher screamed at vein-popping volume. Spudsack's squad car peeled out of its spot and fishtailed its way across the snowy road. When the car pulled up, the kids were much smaller. Their timing couldn't have been worse. The unluckiest boy on earth was at the eye of the lake of fire that was melting the snow off the dormant grass. He was the crown prince of lactose intolerance, on top of a number of sensitive GI issues. He was caught in one of the tubes, which flooded with fire. All of his clothes were made of synthetic material, which melted and stuck to him like napalm. It was only a matter of time before his bloated intestines with their propane tank capacity met the flames. One big agony-induced muscle spasm pushed through all six months of blockage, and the blast hurled his schoolmates over the fence and into the street. Others met a merciful end against the walls of the school, dislodging some of the masonry. A few chained the explosion further when their guts were breached. Wow, I guess the Christmas fundraiser's gonna be tough, Henry said with a stiff grin. Well, don't just stand there, idiot, hide, said Mr. Cumstocking from inside Henry's shoe. Up, up, and away, Henry said with a whoop. Spudsack and Pollux were showered by the glass of the windshield as dairy students came crashing down. Diarrhea jetted from both ends of the ruined body, filling the squad car with a rotten, yeasty aroma. Oh God, oh God, oh God, screamed Pollops. The fat kid's still burning, get it off of me, shrieked Spudsack. His partner didn't follow those orders. He jumped out of the car. Blackened mounds littered the playground, and smoke billowed off of them into the air. A chill seeped into Pollops' very soul. Oh, Lord have mercy, Pollops whispered. Nice job of helping me. What if that napalm shit in that kid's gut had lit me up, huh? I truly appreciate your care and concern. Spudsack furiously wiped greasy ashes off of his coat. He froze and made a face when he ran his hand through rancid feces. He scraped it off and slapped Pollops in the face with it. Now, give me the case file so I can start some notes. We're going to be here a while. Pollux disappeared, but came back empty-handed. Hello? The case files? They're, um... Gone, sir. Gee willikers! Henry said as he dragged the monstrous briefcase through the front door of his house. Couldn't we have stolen my case file and left this behind? No time, gurgled Mr. Cumstocking. Now move quickly. They're on your trail and you don't have much time to study. They'll be looking here soon enough. Henry lit an oil lamp and let the orange rays angle into the bag. The sticky notes were surprisingly well organized, neatly stood up in rows and tightly packed. The handwriting was atrociously small but still legible. Then... He found it. He began reading. There were notes from interviewing him, from interviewing his wife, from interviewing his neighbors and his relatives. But what made his hair stand on end were the notes from interviewing Grandma Beavers. While staying with her on her farm out in the sticks, Timmy had gotten stung by bees and had an allergic reaction. She called 911, and then tried to call Henry. She tried to call two minutes before he had gotten off the phone with his boss. Two minutes. If he had just hung up on his boss and not taken the abuse, he could have heard the phone ring and been there for Timmy. But no, Timmy died without his father, all because he couldn't stand up to his boss. 
Mr. Comstocking sputtered a juicy sigh of satisfaction. Ooh, I think it's time to make your boss a very special sandwich. The puppet slurped. A ball of grief, rage, and destruction boiled in Henry's stomach. He gulped more of his special coffee. His grin returned as tears flowed into it. That sounds swell. But where are we going to get the ingredients? Detective Spudsack sat at his desk without his usual stoic, commanding posture. His shoulders were slouched, and he stared through his desk into a void only he could see. His jowls trembled. A shiver had settled into his ribs and wouldn't leave. Fucky Wucky Falls just wasn't the place that mass murder occurred. It was wrong. No matter how much this crime had cut local greenhouse gas emissions, it was a wound on his conscience. He got to the scene too late. That weighed on him. Someone touched his shoulder and he yelled. It was Polyps. I'm sorry, sir. What do you want? He grunted. Someone called in a tip, sir. Someone that matches Mr. Beaver's description was spotted wandering around the northeast quarter. Northeast quarter? There's nothing up there but old mines. If that's all there is, then that's where he's hiding. Right? Mm. Sir? Spudsack gave a hard nod. Some of the fierceness had returned to his eyes. He wouldn't stay at his home since that would be the first place we'd look. But it wasn't the first place we looked, sir. Shut up. You know what I mean. Gear up. Meet me here at sundown. We'll go throw our man a little housewarming party. Now, when they say the mines are the only thing in the northeast quarter of Fucky Wucky Falls, it's literally the only thing. Between how much land was disturbed and the chemicals they used for drilling, the land wouldn't grow much more than a few clumps of grass per square mile. It truly was Fucky Wucky Falls' very own wasteland. There were only a handful of entrances to the mines. The lawmen had lucked out. They had staked out next to the right aperture. Henry held his oil lantern out, creating a bubble of light in the middle of an ocean of night. There he is, sir. Give him time to go inside. Henry paused before entering. Spudsack felt his pulse quicken. Surely he couldn't see that far out. Or maybe a maniac like him had a special talent for detecting danger. Their man finally went inside and the lantern light faded out. God bless Fucky Wucky Falls, sir. We got him. That's right. You've got him. Oh, uh, what? Go on. Get him. Hold on now. Why me? Oh, Jesus Christ, because if you don't make it, someone has to report back. He kicked Polyps until he got out of the squad car. The poor partner put his long-fingered hands on his hips and sighed. Well, here goes nothing. Polyps didn't like the dark. He was surrounded by it, and there was more of it waiting for him inside the mine shaft. A damp air brushed his face like a ghost's icy ass cheek. He wanted so badly to whip out his flashlight, but he also didn't want to signal Henry. So, he flicked on a lighter he stole from Spudsack. The small flame was brilliant against the darkness. A rotting set of rails led the way forward. A few ancient minecarts sat like tombstones, never to move forward or backward ever again. There were a few artifacts that hinted at attempts at normal life below ground. Benches, moldy bookshelves... There was a makeshift toilet consisting of a bench with a hole carved into it. A rusty pail sat beneath. The shaft began to branch off, and Pollock shivered at the idea of getting lost down there. He imagined things worse than Henry Beavers lurking in the dark. Hungry things. Just waiting for... And there it was. The strangest little Santa Claus that Pollock had ever seen. 
The beard was made of cotton. The hat was a repurposed rag. But the body... He couldn't place it. He knelt, holding the lighter closer for a better look. The light was just within range of a distant crate labeled TNT. His throat closed shut, and he had a convulsion that threw him away from the little Santa Claus. He dropped the lighter. His heartbeat drummed as he felt around for it. He found it and rose to his feet before relighting. Flip. Sure enough, several crates rose to his waist, warnings of the contents in stenciled letters. He leered down at the Santa Claus. It was a bundle of dynamite. He held the lighter up to see that there were a number of festive crafts made from the explosive sticks. There were elves, reindeer, Christmas trees made from green tinsel wrapped around single sticks of dynamite. Just when he thought he had seen the worst of it all, one single item nearly made his heart stop. A crowbar. It was shiny. It was shiny because it was new. It sat next to a crate with the lid pried open and sporting nails like teeth. Polyps wavered as the ground beneath his feet rippled. No. No, he couldn't afford to pass out. He fell to one knee, catching the ground with his free hand. He looked up. Wait. The crowbar was gone. He was both relieved and alarmed. Maybe he dreamed it. No. It was very real. It came crashing down on the back of his skull. When the stars cleared, he saw an oil lamp carving out the grinning face of Henry. He instantly fought to get up, but the crowbar repeatedly struck. Blows found his head and created ringing in his ears. But when the blunt weapon came down on the back of his neck, that's when Polyps didn't get back up. No matter how much his brain commanded his body to do so. Paralyzed. Henry rolled him onto his back and looked at him for a long moment. He disappeared and returned with the toilet bench. He positioned the hole over Polyp's face and unzipped his pants. Your Christmas present is on its way, Henry said. Spudsack didn't want to go into the mine, but the longer his partner delayed the more it was certain that he couldn't sit. He went in without a light. He was waiting for any signs of Henry's lantern, but there was nothing. The stillness of the mine was suffocating. He clicked on his flashlight and had to choke back a scream. There was Polyps on his back, completely naked. His eyes were rolled up into his head in something awful pulled in his mouth. The smell hit him, and he shrank back. Had polyps drowned in shit? There was another acrid smell that bit his nose, but he couldn't name it. That's when he saw the words carved into his dead partner's stomach, apparently gouged with a knife. If you can read this, I'm upside down. Spudsack swallowed hard and looked around. There was nothing to see, aside from a few old crates marked TNT. The shaft floor was bare. He placed his foot on the body and rolled it over. There were more words gouged into his partner's scrawny back. Happy birthday. He had just enough time to read this before he saw the smoking stick of dynamite that was rammed into the body's relaxed rectum. Another day passed. Another winter sunset signaled the end of the business day. Color began to bleed back into Henry's vision as he staggered around the business district of Fucky Wucky Falls. With it came grief and a mental agony that crushed his skull like a vice. 
He would have to brew more of his special coffee soon. He was having a hard time finding his way. Fucky Wucky Falls was small, but its business district was considerable. A car came within inches of striking Henry. It veered off and crushed a fire hydrant and then a traffic light. The light's fragile chassis fell over, exposing the tearing wires that flailed about and found the fountain of water. Sparks flew and fingers of raw electricity writhed across the ground like demonic serpents. The driver began crying for help. Henry jumped into action. Hey, you need to trust me, he yelled to the driver. You need to listen to me before your car explodes and takes you with it. Now, open your door. The driver was a 60-something man that eyed the expanding lake of water and the electricity that ribboned through it. He obeyed and threw the door open as wide as possible. Um, what do I do now? Jump! Quickly! I, I can't. Get to safety before the water rises too high. The man shouldn't have been able to make the jump, but he did. Henry helped him up and hurried him out of the way of the water that rose just high enough to touch the car and send a current of deadly power through it. The fireball of the exploding gas tank was blinding. Warped chunks of metal rained down, but none of them hit Henry or the driver. Young man, you've saved me. I owe you my life. Swell, said Henry. He then shoved the driver into the deadly water. His body instantly writhed and contorted as the high voltage tore through his living tissue. His mouth went wide with a primal howl of undiluted agony. Threads of blue light danced from the roof of his mouth to his tongue. Henry studied that mouth. If he knew his electrical theory correctly... He got out his coffee maker and prepared the basket with his special blend. Dime store coffee grounds, caffeine pills, stolen Prozac, an orphan's molars, a few rubber bands for extra bitterness. He filled the water reservoir and crossed his fingers as he lowered the plug into the jostling driver's mouth. The coffee maker began to hiss and gurgle. Soon enough, there was the hot, happy, jolly brew, the one that kept him on the straight and narrow. The left eyeball of the convulsing body exploded, and Henry just barely avoided a spill. His pulse went from zero to a thousand in a snap. You worthless shit fuck! Henry roared. He caught himself, embarrassed. Gee willikers, I'm sorry about that, chief. I haven't had a fresh cup of coffee in a while. I'm a different person without it. A wet pop announced that the body's left thigh had burst out of its socket. Henry took a swig of the acrid coffee. Soon enough, the thrashing body was lying on a beach, napping serenely beneath the sun. It opened its eyes, smiling, despite the hollow socket curdled with gore. The power cord in its mouth was replaced by a cigarette. Ah, I'm no prude, Henry. Besides... What a swell day for being on the sand. Super swell, chief. Super swell. Henry felt the sting of tears. Are you okay there, Henry? Yeah, I just... Um... Thanks for being understanding. The body furrowed its brows and waved a hand as if to say, Don't mention it. But Henry wasn't done. You know, I've tried to be a good Christian man. I've tried to do right by everybody, and I mean, doggone it, it seemed like the more I tried to do right by everybody, the fewer people I could do right by. And then, well, when things went bad for my son, I I just couldn't do right by anyone. Not my wife, not my friends, not God. It's enough to make a man crazy. You were crazy to think trying so hard would do you any good. You are the perfect picture of sanity now, let me tell you. Henry laughed and cried both. The body stroked the sandy beach. Take a vacation, Henry. It does you wonders. I will. After I've done with this one last job, 
It shook its head. I heard what you're up to, Henry. I think you've wasted enough time. I know you want to be there for Timmy, but it's a bit late. Better late than never, brother. Don't waste your vacation talking to a wash-up like me. We'll see you around, Henry. The body reverted to its true form. Flesh blackened and smoking, agitating the water. It wasn't the first time that the staff of the towering Ambelco building saw Henry come through the front doors. He had come through them for years as a salaried employee. After his son's accident, he looked more haggard and smelled worse each time. Then they only saw him when he escaped. From the institution. This was the first time in years, though he came in with a smile. He was on the pretty young secretary before she knew what was happening. He grabbed her curly blonde locks with one hand, and he had a stick of dynamite in the other. Her moans of suppressing her gag reflux backfired. The deadly stick slid down her throat. Henry pushed her towards the oncoming security guards. The explosion happened deep in her chest, launching her silicon implants with deadly velocity. One of them atomized a guard's face. The other one decapitated a homeless lady using a public Xerox machine from a hundred yards away. Henry twisted off the secretary's lower jaw and drove both points into the remaining guard's eyes. His new visor made him scream in sightless pain. A third guard rounded a distant corner. He was tall. He was shaped like a bloated Christmas tree. He was old. Old enough to recognize Henry. Oh, beavers, not again! Hellfire kindled in Henry's eyes and his grin clenched tightly enough to fuse his teeth together. Chief Anderson. Don't you know by now? You'll never work harder than me. You're probably still sneaking extra lunch from the kitchen during paid hours. The reality of the carnage sank in, and the lumbering chief beelined for an alarm. The secretary's jawless head was attached to her body by just a few fibers of connective tissue. One good flick and a snap like a celery stalk, and her head was free. He gripped the hair and whirled it above him. Blood fanning out in circles. The sweet young thing's cranium bulleted like a bolt of lightning and struck Anderson in the back of the knee. He smacked the carpet like a great garbage sack full of pudding. Henry sauntered towards the floundering chief of security. The large man just managed to roll himself over in time to see Henry attack a cowering old man and grab his wooden cane. He rammed the full length of it down the elder's throat and yanked it back out. As the old man crawled off to die of internal hemorrhaging, Henry snapped the bloody cane over his knee into two parts, each with a sharp end. You're an asshole, Beavis, Anderson cried in shock. Sorry, Anderson. I'm afraid you're the asshole. Henry drew back both halves like spears. And on the dick. The later it got, the more agitated Carl Burdens got. He was waiting for his hot new secretary to text him that it was time to sneak off. He couldn't risk them being seen together, but she was taking her sweet time. He didn't want to have to face coming home to his wife without a little action... But even as quickly as he usually finished, they would be pressed for time if she delayed any longer. He collapsed into his office chair behind his desk. He looked up, just in time for the double doors of his grand office to crash open. A dinner cart in the cafeteria sailed in. On it, lard hanging over the edges, was the naked body of his chief of security. Two bloody wooden sticks protruded from his eye sockets. He was screaming like a stuck pig. It took Burdens a minute to realize he was stuck with some third item. There was something... Oh, God. Something was sticking out of his ass. 
Something red. Something smoking. The explosion blew Anderson's entire digestive tract, from the colon to the tip of his tongue, out of his gaping mouth. It smacked into burdens and wrapped around him and his hair like a hunter's bola. Henry approached from behind the gutted corpse. Beavers? What the actual fuck? I finally figured it out. My mom tried to call me and tell me about my son. I was on the phone with you, so she couldn't get through. You were screaming at me about a sandwich. A sandwich! I missed my chance to be next to my dying son because you were pissy over a sandwich! Burden squinted at him, tilting his head. You don't remember? Oh, I remember, Burden grunted. Then he yelled, That's what you get for making a shitty sandwich! Henry looked at the two fragments of Kane and Anderson's dead skull, wondered which one would be best. But then he saw the small letter opener on his former boss's desk. I'm going to peel the living flesh off your head and drink in your screams, said Henry, as he put the letter opener between his teeth and began to roll up his sleeves. Another bang broke the air, not of dynamite, a gunshot. Burden's left hand, wrapped tightly as it was by entrails, held a smoking revolver. The bullet had pierced one of Henry's lungs. Blood shot up into his sinuses. He sneezed. He blinked away the red that clouded his vision, and, well, the letter opener was buried in Burden's eye. Henry wanted to laugh, but he couldn't. He gawked at the limp body of his boss. He was surprised to find himself enraged at how peaceful the corpse appeared, even with the letter opener protruding from its eye. Henry, with his racing pulse and his ragged breathing, was the one suffering. No, 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 no. If there was anything like a soul down inside that man, Henry was going to make damn well sure that got a taste of fire. He staggered over to the remaining bundles of festive dynamite and began decorating the corpse with them. He plugged every orifice with what would fit. He found some duct tape in the desk and wrapped as many of the deadly sticks to the body as the remaining tape would allow. Henry's vision swam and flickered. He didn't have much time. He clinked to open his lighter, casting wobbly rays that trembled like Henry's lungs. Daddy? Came a voice from beside Henry. It was Timmy. Henry didn't smile at him. His brow furrowed. His eyes pooled with pink tears. His whole frame trembled the way it did when he had driven his old truck with Timmy riding in the back. Hey. Hey, son. It's good to see you. You gonna blow this man up, Dad? Yeah. Yeah, I am. He's not fit to be buried in the same earth you were. His grave is going to be the dust of the air and the walls. His tombstone is going to be the rubble of this building. But Dad, I don't want you to blow up too. Henry sniffed which triggered a bloody cough. It's a little late for me, son. Besides, I'm not fit to be buried in the earth with you either. Please don't say that, Daddy. You died because I missed a phone call, son. I let this son of a bitch hold me up on the phone. I was too afraid of losing my job to hang up on him. Grandma tried to call me while he was cussing me out. I I let this man keep me from being there for you, son. 
I'm just as guilty as he is. But Daddy, I was hurt anyway. That wasn't your fault. Yes, it was. I've never been there for you. Not for your, your, your ball games, not for your birthdays, not your... Your passing. Henry lost it and sobbed, his pink tears turning red. I forgive you, Daddy. I don't. Please. You were supposed to be my life. Everything went with you. Your mom never forgave me. How could she? How could I? I don't have it in me, son. I don't have anything inside of me. Timmy stared at his father with the stillness of a cardboard cutout. Henry caught his breath, sensing that his lungs were starting to fill with blood. Listen, tis the season, and I also remembered that today was your birthday. Emotion flashed in the phantom's eyes. You remembered? Henry lit as many fuses as his shaking hand would allow. Their acrid smoke mingled with the metallic stink of blood. I love you, son. Now, make a wish, huh? Timmy paused, considering. But he just threw his arms around Henry and held tight. Legend has it. Timmy whispered his wish into his father's ear. But we'll never know. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. 